Tonight we're focusing in on Zoom with Galaxy AI on the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Ah, a baby tiger. Check out his claws as he prepares to pounce on that frog. Close one, but not as close as this Zoom. We can literally count the whiskers and... Oh look, Mum's here. Good thing I'm nowhere nearby. Go wild with Galaxy AI on the new S24 Ultra and zoom in on the epic day or night. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour One. Hello, America. I'm back. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on the program? I got to switch stuff up a little bit on the fly here uh, because we've got some news we got to deal with out of the gate. And that is uh, the markets. Uh, The Dow is down 335 points. The NASDAQ down almost 200 S&P 500 down 45. Now, this is significant because we've got new data out uh, and the revisions uh, to inflation are worse than expected. And a key Fed inflation measure rose six tenths of a percent in January, which is more than they expected. The personal consumption expenditures price index, excluding food and energy. Uh, They exclude food and energy because food and energy are more volatile than other items. And so you exclude food and energy and personal consumption uh, expenditures still rose six-tenths of a percent. Uh, That was up 4.7% from a year before. Wall Street had been expecting a five-tenths of a percent. Including food and energy consumptions, headline inflation increased six-tenths of a percent. Uh, This is bad because it suggests that the Fed is um, (laughs) going to have to continue to raise interest rates even more. Uh, It is looking less and less likely that they can slow the economy without triggering a recession. This is the uh, Cleveland Fed president. The problem, President Mester, is history is not really on your side. You don't have, you as I mean the Federal Reserve, not you personally, doesn't have a terrific track record of bringing down inflation without a recession. And this is the other side of Andrew's question, which is, do you think a recession is likely? Can you avoid a recession and still get back to your 2% target? So my forecast is that growth will slow this year and be well below trend. Um, I still hold to that forecast. So when you're that low, you know, it doesn't take much of some kind of shock that you're not anticipating, which is the nature of a shock. You don't anticipate them. That can push you into negative growth for a time. But, you know, when you talk to your business contacts, you know, they're all sort of preparing for that kind of recession. But when you talk to to one, they say it's going to be mild. So, again, I, I, I think we can get back to price stability. What's different now is our commitment to getting back to 2% and all the things we've learned over time about how important it is to have that commitment, to communicate it, to be very clear about where we're going, right? As clear as we can without being prescient. We're not prescient, <clears throat> right? right? but to be very clear. And that's what's going to get us back to 2%. So the Cleveland Federal Reserve president largely acknowledging there's going to be a recession and now suggesting, well, they all say it's going to be a mild recession. It's still going to be a recession. Uh, Hold on to your hats. We will, uh, we got more information there later, but uh, now I want to pivot back to where I wanted to start with the Buttigieg stuff. Have you noticed this pattern where when Democrats do not wish to acknowledge a problem, they choose not to go see it. So for the longest time, Joe Biden refused to acknowledge there was any sort of problem with illegal aliens at the border, so he just simply didn't go to the border. He sent Kamala Harris to the South and made sure she didn't go to the border. They refused to go see the border. And when he finally did, after public outrage built, go to the border, he made sure to go to a part of El Paso, Texas, that wasn't dealing with the problem. So he could say, there's no problem here. Look, there's no problem. I'm looking around. There's no problem. He didn't go to McAllen, Texas. He didn't go to the areas where there was a problem. So he did not have to acknowledge the problem. It's what they do. You have this Jane's Revenge group going around firebombing pregnancy centers around the country. So the Democrats refuse to look at it. They they don't want to acknowledge it. 
They think these are bad things. They want to attack them. They don't want to acknowledge it. They don't see it. And so they don't have to acknowledge there's a problem because they don't see it. And now you've got East Palestine, Ohio, where Pete Buttigieg refused to go, refused to go, refused to go. And then after 20 days, 20 days later, decided to go. Now, this is the this is the core nugget here for you to take away. Buttigieg was interested in appearances. The media was not talking about East Palestine, Ohio. So why should he? It wasn't going to get him attention if the media wasn't paying attention to it. And because the media wasn't paying attention to it, he, the Secretary of Transportation, did not pay attention to it because he's concerned about appearances. He's not concerned about the job. He's not concerned about the work. He's concerned about the appearances. This is a problem A problem that transcends partisan politics, by the way, is lightweights who are concerned about the exposure, and they're not going to go where the cameras aren't. When the cameras went to East Palestine to see what was going on, then Pete Buttigieg decided to to act. I want to play you audio, and I want to play you audio from before he went to after he went. What you're about to hear are four clips in the run-up to him not going to East Palestine. But it's been two weeks since this derailment. When is the time right? So I'm planning to go, and when I do, it will be focused on action, not on politics, not on show. Uh, In the early days, I have been respecting the role that the independent NTSB plays and staying out of their way. But we are now entering the policy phase of our response to this. And even as NTSB continues finalizing their work, uh, this is the right time for us to be looking at immediate steps from USDOT. (laughs) <laughs> right. It, that has been, uh, we're not going because we don't want to be a distraction from the NTSB, which is still investigating. But even though they're still investigating, now we believe now is the time for us to go because we're looking at the policy phase. Uh, you said you weren't going because they were still investigating. And then you said they're still investigating, but now you're going to go. And I just have to ask, because it did take you a couple of days to respond publicly uh, or several days to respond publicly to this particular incident. Do you wish you would have spoken out sooner? Yes, I was uh, focused on just making sure that uh, our folks on the ground uh, were all set, but uh, could have spoken sooner about how strongly I felt uh, about this incident. And uh, that's a lesson learned for me. Uh <laughs> Right. One more. So I am planning to visit. I have followed the norm in the first days of the crash response of uh, staying out of the way of the independent NTSB. The National Transportation Safety Board has the lead on the investigative part. But don't don't you have a state out of the way the independent and not my fault, not my charge, not not my purview. Well, to be clear, our department was on the ground within hours, uh, helping with the response and the investigation. Again, I respect the separate role of NTSB, but we have been on the ground literally from day one. This is a guy in damage control mode. Those were the four clips in the run-up to him actually going. So what did he do once he went? Well, he decided he needed to blame Donald Trump and he needed to make a partisan bit of it. Now, notice he said, I played you the clip, he was going to go and he wasn't going to make this partisan. He wasn't going to do politics. He's in the policy phase of this. And then he went on MSNBC. I don't know where uh, Tucker Carlson was when they were trying to dismantle the EPA, which is now uh, maybe the main thing standing between the people of East Palestine and ecological disaster. Uh, Look, uh, uh, they they they're always ready to take it back to race. But the reality is that uh, we're going to serve everybody Uh, because one thing, you know, how a broken clock is, is right at least twice, twice a day. One thing he's exactly right about is that uh, environmental disasters uh, tend to happen more frequently and more painfully to lower income communities. We call that environmental justice. And yet if I use those words, I'm sure he'll be the first one to say that we're, uh, we're too woke uh, <laughs> to be paying attention to, uh, to the bread and butter of our jobs. Part of the bread, or but- bread and butter of our job is to keep people safe from being harmed or killed. Didn't really do a good job keeping people safe here, did you? Uh, this this is also Buttigieg moving from blaming Tucker Carlson to blaming and, and making it all about Donald Trump. Well, one thing he could do is uh, uh, express support for reversing the deregulation uh, that uh, happened on his watch. That's right. Uh, so let, let, let's boil this down for you. Pete Buttigieg says he's not going to play politics and then immediately plays politics, blames 
Donald Trump goes after Tucker Carlson, can't take responsibility. Can we just stop for a moment, please? Just think about his claims about the Trump deregulation of the railroad industry. One of the reasons the Trump administration got rid of the uh, pneumatic brake regulations that they've targeted, which, by the way, had nothing to do with this wreck, uh, is because it actually, in a cost-benefit analysis, was way more cost than benefit. You heard Pete Buttigieg the other day say there are a 1,000 wrecks, train derailments a year. Most of those are in rail yards. Most of them are insignificant. There are rarely significant situations like this. They happen, but not at a 1,000 a, a year, which is what he tried to claim. Buttigieg can't advance the policy because he's out of his depth. Buttigieg was the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, who filled potholes and changed streetlights. That's about it. He wasn't very good when it came to crime and safety. He ran for president of the United States as a, as a 39, 40-year-old mayor. Think of the arrogance Think of the arrogance and pretension of a 39, 40-year-old mayor deciding he's qualified to be president of the United States. If Pete Buttigieg weren't gay, everyone would laugh about it. Now, I know you have to tread lightly on that. People get very upset when you say things like that. But if Pete Buttigieg were a heterosexual mayor of South Bend, Indiana, who ran a failed presidential bid, that would have been the last we've heard of him. Beto who? Beto O'Rourke was a member of Congress when he challenged Ted Cruz and then attempted his presidential bid. He got laughed off stage. Pete Buttigieg is a mayor of South Bend, Indiana, and he got to run for president because he was gay. That's really it. In the intersectional woke politics of the Democrats, that was heralded as some major, major advance. And the Biden administration, once elected, decided they needed to fill out the cabinet and make it as intersectionally diverse as possible. So they threw in Pete Buttigieg to be secretary of transportation, checking a box, put him in there. Oh, you, you don't believe me. I know there, there are Democrats out there who are enraged when you say this stuff. In, fa in fact, the White House pushes back very vehemently. Because how dare you say he got the job because he's gay? It shouldn't be about his sexuality. But the reality is the Biden administration made it about that because he's not qualified to do the job. And the only reason he got the job was because of that. If he were Beto O'Rourke, a former member of Congress who ran for president and for the U.S. Senate, he got, he got nothing. Where's Beto O'Rourke in the cabinet? He's more qualified than Buttigieg. You don't believe me on the diversity stuff. Listen, this is Corrine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, talking this stuff up. I want to take the opportunity to, to lay out uh, what how diverse the president's cabinet has been, how diverse the president's administration has been. Uh, the cabinet is majority people of color for the first time in history. The cabinet is majority female for the first time in history. A majority of White House senior staff identify as female. Forty percent. Wait, 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 wait. Identify as female. They're, they're not females. They identify as female. That that is some like next level like like. Get word games there. White House senior staff identify as part of the racially diverse communities and a record seven assistants to the presidents are openly LGBTQ+. So again, this is something that the president prides himself on, uh, that he ha actually has taken action to show uh, the diversity of this administration. I want to take... Um, there you have it. That's how Pete got his job. He may not like it. He, he may not like to acknowledge that that had a lot to do with it, but it's true. The, the White House press secretary herself admits it in bragging about the data, in bragging about the, the uh, diversity of the cabinet positions. They wanted the cabinet to be as diverse as possible, even at the expense of competence. And Pete Buttigieg is not competent. He's out of his depth. Pete Buttigieg took, a, took paternity leave and no one even knew it. In fact, while he was on paternity leave, most people missed he was actually on tour. There was a big 
hagiographic documentary about him running for president. And he started showing up around the country when they were debuting the films at different locations. People, the press gave him a pass because the press is on his side. The press tends to humor the guy. The press loves the guy because he's this great alignment of intersectional woke next generation Democrat. But he's out of his depth. Both information and misinformation injected into this situation. None of which is to the benefit of the community uh, when it comes to that misinformation. The Norfolk, sir. So I think, so I lost my train of thought. Um, he lost his train of thought at the train derailment. Yep, real good there, Pete. If you own a small to medium-sized business that kept employees on payroll through COVID, you may have a big cash refund waiting for you. The employee retention credit is a tax credit of up to $26,000 per employee, and now more businesses than ever qualify. The experts at RefundsPro.com specialize in cutting through the red tape of qualifying for this government program. Most of their refunds are over $100,000. Even businesses that have received PPP funds may be eligible, and there are absolutely no fees unless you receive a refund. There's no reason not to apply. If your business experienced shutdowns, limited capacity, supply chain challenges, or even reduced revenue due to COVID, you likely qualify. RefundsPro.com has already helped hundreds of businesses, so don't lose the refund you're owed by missing the deadline. Get started today with a free five-minute questionnaire at Refunds with an S, RefundsPro.com. That's Refunds with an S, Pro. Dot com. Well, I'm I'm not feeling a hundred percent, but I'm definitely feeling better than I was uh, when I had to abandon you people in the middle of the show the other day. Stomach bug going around my neck of the woods. Uh, we'll we, today is an open line Friday. It's Friday, of course. We'll take your phone calls eight seven seven nine seven three seven four two five. However, having been cooped up in bed for the last forty eight hours, uh, I I got a lot to say. And you're just gonna have to be patient with me because I I gotta I, I got some I got things I gotta get off my chest that have just been building up while I've been laying down, but so we'll get there. I I do want to play real quick though this audio that I couldn't. Well, I'm glad she said it. I, I am glad uh, Joy Behar said what she said. People I don't know why they would ever vote for him because for somebody who, who, by the way, he placed someone with deep ties to the chemical industry in charge of the EPA's chemical safety office. That's who you voted for in that district. Donald Trump, who reduces all safety. He yeah. did. Do in they those showed days. up at Do McDonald's and those voters yeah, but, saw something on the ground that yeah. probably it, resonates in a that's way that the they thing. need. Yeah, but they need to look past the photo of ops, course. these people, and but say, who's doing the job here? Forget about the photo ops. Showing, showing up is a big Showing up, I think, is I think this community. is Donald Trump's fault. So you, you got this. Joy Bayer, with no repercussions, by the way. Uh, basically says the people of East Palestine, Ohio, got what they deserve because they voted for Donald Trump. That gives you kind of the sentiment uh, on the left these days. Uh, there's no difference between Joy Behar on the left and Marjorie Taylor Greene on the right calling for some sort of divorce. Uh, they both hate the other side. Uh, they're not willing to show any level of compassion to the other side. It's it's a, 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 a level of grossness, and we used to have presidential leaders who would call that sort of stuff out on their own side. Joe Biden's not going to say anything about Joy Bayar. Now, with the economic turmoil out there today with the markets down, I need to shift gears and remind you guys about Advantage Gold because uh, Advantage Gold is TrustLink's number one highest rated gold company seven years in a row. And if you got questions about using gold to, well, help with your investment portfolio, Call them, 800-450-2566. They're highly informative and educational. They've really got the best people and the best deals, the best rates, the best IRA department. They can navigate you through using precious metals, particularly gold, as part of your retirement planning or your investment portfolio. There are steps you do legally have to take if you want to use gold as part of your retirement planning, and you should talk to the experts at Advantage Gold about those things, 800 450 Two five six six. They can answer any questions you have, uh, including whether or not your existing setup for investments or retirement qualifies for what they have. Call them at 800-450-2566. There are a lot of questions you probably have about gold, particularly right now as hedging against inflation, volatility in the stock market or whatnot. Advantage Gold can help you. 800-450-2566.
Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number 877-973-7425. It is a free for all today on the phones. You can call it about other stuff. Those of you on the phones, though, you got to be patient because while I was laying in bed, I had deep thoughts, deep thoughts about things that need to be said. And then I saw the George W. Bush thing. I want to talk about that. It all ties together. Former President Bush uh, has pushed back on criticism about the American aid to Ukraine. Uh, He said this, I think we're a big enough nation to do more than one thing. And continuing to fight against AIDS on the continent of Africa and supporting the Ukrainian fear freedom fighters is not going to constrain our capacity to help our own citizens. In a grown-up world, George Bush is right. In a grown-up world, the United States can lead globally and also locally. In a grown-up world, the United States can continue to implement PEPFAR in Africa. They're probably one of the greatest uh, health aid programs ever to be conceived on planet Earth. It has dramatically reduced rates of HIV and AIDS across an entire continent, a continent larger than the North American continent. It's done a, a phenomenal job. And we should be able to help the people of Ukraine. We should be able to help the people of Ukraine. And we should also be able to help our own citizens. But that's the problem. And this gets to Pete Buttigieg, and this gets to Joy Behar. This this gets to the problems we have in this country at, at a national level. We're getting the small things wrong. We're, we're, we're not doing the small things well. We've got problems in the country. And this administration, and to some degree even the prior administration, seemed to look elsewhere, to fix elsewhere, to deal with things at a small level to help uh, those loyal to a side as opposed to helping all Americans. How many of the Democrats out there, if they were really honest, Joy Behar among them from The View, who essentially says the people of East Palestine deserve what they got because they voted for Donald Trump. How many of the Democrats inside the White House, Pete Buttigieg's staff at the at the Department of Transportation and others, look at this stuff, yeah, it's East Palestine. I mean, it's not Beverly Hills. Screw them. They can help themselves. They're all about rugged individualism. How many, you and I know darn well that there have been people in this administration over the last 20 days who have said things very similar to Joy Bayar. They have said things like, uh, they just voted for J.D. Vance. Let him help them. They don't need our help. They're not going to vote for us. It's not a vote. So it's it's not worth bothering them. And this is the problem. Washington used to work for the people, even though it didn't work well. It still worked some. And it worked for people regardless of partisanship. It worked for people regardless of their votes. It worked for people regardless of constituency. And more and more these days, both sides playing for tribal sports decide that if I can't get a vote out of this, why am I going to bother? But not only that, beyond that, there's also a level of incompetence involved. We're not sending the best and brightest to Washington, D.C. We're not ha- we're not stocking the bureaucracy with the best and brightest. We're stocking them with people who couldn't get a job in the private sector. And so the result is that we have an American people who don't want to help the Ukrainians. They don't see it's in our national interest. And, and you've got the, the, the people who are... Uh, who, who are isolationists or to some degree really are enamored with the Russians because Vladimir Putin bashes the woke, so therefore they're Team Putin. I mean, but Vladimir Putin gave a speech the other day and essentially took on the, the corrupt, lazy, hedonistic West. And you've got people online are like, yeah, he's right. I mean, why are we battling Russia? He's right about the wokes. You know, he says these things to lure away simple-minded fools from the, from, uh, the West. He's playing you and you want to be played by him. But you look at the stuff we're doing in this country, and it really does seem like the country's lost its damn mind. 
You've got uh, you, you got more people are invested in Drag Queen Story Hour than in East Palestine, Ohio. The country seems like it's gone off the rails. The, the, our, our, we can't educate our kids. Our schools don't function well. The post office doesn't function well. The TSA going through airports is a nightmare. The basic functions of government in this country aren't doing well. And that breeds resentment. And you know, th- this is something I think the Biden administration should appreciate and understand. If you just stop, if you put on hiatus for just a minute, if you just pause the diversity, equity, inclusion BS for just a minute, if you stopped the advance of human rights of one-tenth of one percent of the country, That is, if you stopped advancing the transgender agenda over everything else in the country right now, if you you stopped the culture war on gas stoves, if you stopped the intersectional nonsense on display everywhere, and you just focused on the core competencies of the government, stop advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and start advancing the mail on time. Stop advancing drag queen story hour and actually fix the potholes. Stop advancing promiscuity and hedonism and actually teach kids reading, writing, and arithmetic. Maybe people would be less in the camp of, well, we can't do anything here, so why are we helping Ukraine? I don't know that either party really understands this. I specifically don't think the Democrats understand it right now. The Democrats are always in revolutionary mode. They want to. They want to advance transgenderism. They they want to normalize drag queen story hour. They they want to normalize everything. They want to define deviancy down. What was normal and is now bad. What was bad is now normal. The Democrats want to normalize every bit of hedonistic lifestyle in America. They want to tell you you're a bigot if you don't go along with it. They're always advancing. They're always in revolutionary mode. They're always the culture warriors. We're telling the right. They're the culture warriors for just wanting to stand pat, stand put, and preserve the status quo. Somehow we're the culture warriors for not wanting to go along with the culture war. And what they don't do are the core competencies. We're not educating our kids. Cities that spend disproportionate amounts of money on public schooling are turning out kids who are illiterate. We've got kids who can't do basic math. We're saddling them with student loan debt to get through college to get meaningless college degrees. Our infrastructure is crumbling. You know, it's allowed the conspiracy theorists of the world to speculate someone must be sabotaging the rail lines all over the country. There have been sabotage of the rail lines from a wacky environmentalist over the last couple of years, but these numbers of derailments were happening. It's because our infrastructure screwed up. And by the way, you should also know, thanks to government regulation, it actually is a pain in the butt for the rail companies to take care of their own lines because of the hassles they have to go through. They can't do it expeditiously. They can't do it efficiently. The government drags things out and makes it difficult and costly to do things. It costs more, for example, in this country to deal with public transportation, to build a subway system, to, to, to drill underground, to, to make a subway line. It costs overwhelmingly more than it does in other parts of the world because of American bureaucracy, because we outsource so much to uh, high-tech consultants, because we rely on the McKinsey consultants of the world to tell us what to do, and the McKinsey consultants of the world, by virtue of their name, claim to get it right, and often they get it wrong. And then you've got a situation like East Palestine, Ohio. Train derailed 20 days ago. And until the media attention got focused on it, the Secretary of Transportation was uninvolved with it. Until the spotlight was put on it and his absence from the spotlight was noted, he didn't need to be in the spotlight, didn't care to be in the spotlight, didn't care to pay attention to it. It was all about appearances. If this administration, if every administration were focused more on competence not partisanship, not who benefits, not not gaming it out to say, well, there are so many blue-collar Trump voters here, screw them. You would bolster your arguments everywhere else. There is a prevailing sentiment that if Joe Biden can't change people's minds on Ukraine over time, all the support for it is going to fade away. But he can't change people's minds and bolster the Ukrainian cause when at home he can't get the basics right. You know, 
George Bush, the tide turned on Bush after Katrina. People were willing to allow him aggressiveness abroad, allow him the surge. But when Katrina came through and there was such a disaster and he had Michael Brown at FEMA and he told Brownie he was doing a good job and he really wasn't, it suddenly made people realize, how can we spend all of our time abroad and we can't get the basics right at home? We've had cities in this country destroyed by a massive hurricane and we're focusing on Iraq. Why? That seems that seems bad. And the sentiment turned rapidly. The Democrats took advantage of Bush flying over New Orleans, looking out the window. They said he was cold. He was cruel for just looking out the window, not actually being on the ground. Now, it's very much like Pete Buttigieg. They're giving Buttigieg a pass for staying out of the way for 20 days. Bush did not want to land on the ground. He did not want to divert resources to him when they needed to clean up. And the left said it was, it was cold. It was awful. It was mean for him just to fly over. And the media enabled the sentiment to fester, that Bush was far more interested in Iraq and Afghanistan than home. That sentiment's never gone away. It stays administration to administration, that they're far more interested in picking winners and losers, which is true. They're far more interested than awarding to award partisans on their side as opposed to just helping Americans every day. And when you look at what's going on in the country right now, you see this pattern recurring that people in this country feel left behind. They feel ignored by Washington. They feel like Washington has made things worse. They're still reeling from lockdowns and COVID. They're still reeling from economic uh, disaster from having been shut down and their businesses closed up by government fiat because of a virus. And now it turns out the wearing masks the whole time, more and more studies show really didn't do a whole lot of good in large part because people weren't wearing masks. They weren't wearing N95 masks. They weren't, weren't wearing them well. And by the way, they generally weren't working anyway. And yet you still got some states in this country that demand kids are still wearing masks in school. Yes, there are still enclaves in this country where they're still making kids go to school wearing masks because of COVID. Our government seems uninterested in helping Americans unless they can get a vote out of it. And that has bred contempt for Washington. Our government is failing our kids They've given up on trying to educate our kids, and now they want to indoctrinate them into sexuality. And that has frustrated Americans. Our government is unable to take care of the poor and needy in this country. Really doesn't seem like it wants to take care of the poor and needy in this country unless they can get a vote out of it. Meanwhile, they want to fund hundreds of millions of billions of dollars to Ukraine. I support funding Ukraine. I do. I support the war effort in Ukraine. I do. But I got to tell you, it it makes it very difficult to defend the action when it seems like our government can't get the basics in this country right. It's not trash collection because that's a local government job, but it is delivery of the mail, which they continue to screw up. It is delivery of resources to local communities, which they continue to screw up. It is delivery of an education system that actually educates our kids, which they continue to screw up. Our government continues to screw up at home all of these things. If the government would just get the basics right, stop with the woke DEI crap and just get the basics of government right. Stop trying to revolutionary revolutionize, expand diversity quotas in government and just actually get the job of government done. Stop trying to hire people because of who they sleep with or their skin color and hire competent people to get the job done and show people government can still work whether there's a vote there or not. And then maybe you might be able to turn the tide to people to say, yes, we can fix our country and we can take care of people like the Ukrainians. But unless you can show people that we actually can take care of Americans, you're not going to convince a lot of people that we should be spending our time helping Ukraine when we've got people in East Palestine, Ohio, waiting for Pete Buttigieg to show up. And he only showed up because Donald Trump beat him to it. It's going to be real hard to convince Americans to do more on the world stage when you can't show them you're doing the basics competently here at home. You know, one of the issues of competence here, it goes back to education. And it's one reason Patriot Mobile has stood up and started funding uh, parents to take on the wokes on school boards. 
If you take your cell phone business to Patriot Mobile, you get guaranteed great service, probably on the same cell towers you're already using. But then they, unlike your current cell phone company, take a portion of their profits and they fund conservative parents running for school board offices around the country against the wokes. And they fund the pro-life movement and the Second Amendment movement. It's a great way for you to help fund the conservative movement just by moving your cell phone business to Patriot Mobile. You can even keep your existing cell phone number. You go to PatriotMobile.com slash Eric, PatriotMobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K, or you can call them 972-PATRIOT. Tell them I sent you. You get guaranteed great service from Patriot Mobile, and tell them I sent you. You get free activation. It's PatriotMobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K or 972-PATRIOT. They've got 100% U.S.-based customer service. They give you guaranteed great service. They take a portion of their profits and fund the causes you care about in the conservative movement and the candidates you care about, too. PatriotMobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. Hello there. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. It is an open line Friday. You can call in and set the agenda. In fact, to some degree, you'd be helping me out as I recover from the stomach bug. 877-973-7425. Lewis, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Derek, I want to say this about the yeah. I want to say this about the railroad issue. Uh, that really does fall back on Norfolk Southern Railroad, and the reason it being is they're a service to whoever has the goods on those cars. So they're paid. They're paid to haul that equipment, and they're responsible for the upkeep of their rail cars in the mm-hmm. rail. So if that rail car was not supposed to move because there was a defect, they are the ones that are going to have to foot the bill yep. for this issue. Now, where the government comes in is if they don't do what they're supposed to do, then the government has to force them to clean it up. And if the government has to clean it up, then they send them a big, fat bill. But really and truly, like in the trucking industry, uh, if something happens, it's on me, the driver. Uh, it's yeah. not on, you know, the, the customer. Yeah, you know, and I think that's kind of what's being missed in all this this conversation about infrastructure and the rail lines and, and the like, Lewis, is, yeah, the, Norfolk Southern it caused this. Norfolk Southern pays for it. Taxpayers aren't responsible, and they better get it right um, or else they need to get it right. Um, they they got to they gotta make things right for East Palestine, Ohio, not you and not me, not our taxpayer dollars. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.